Hi, I'm Ali Patterson. On this episode of Fintech Finance, we're going to be talking with Saxo Payments around some of the issues with cross-border transactions. We also speak with Alipay to hear a little bit around their European expansion. And we catch up with Chris Skinner to get some of his views on fintechs and banks. So firstly, I went to speak with Anders Lacour from Saxo Payments to find out some of his thoughts and views on cross-border transactions. Cross-border payments when you talk about the bank transfers yeah. uh, are actually quite complicated given that you need to access uh, clearing in each country. And each region in the world has uh, different file formats that all have to, uh, to speak together. I think what, what, what we have done in Saxo Payments is that we've tried to, to reinvent or rebuild the existing system. Uh, but that being said, we're working with uh, all the major banks uh, and uh, um, we've had the privilege of setting this up from scratch. However, using existing uh, tools and existing uh, systems, uh, and in that way we've been able to build it without legacy. That makes us, uh, that gives us the ability to deliver the payments typically much faster and, uh, and more convenient than uh, than if you use the traditional bank industry. In, uh, in some parts of the world, we can, we can actually do it, uh, do it same day. Uh, and in, uh, in other parts of the world, we will uh, we'll be able to deliver uh, the money the next day. I then went to speak with Rita Liu from Alipay to hear about some of their European expansion plans. So uh, back to the point uh, about partnership, you know, uh, like you said, uh, Every, uh, there are so many countries in Europe and every country is so different. That's why we need to leverage uh, different partners in different countries, their local uh, know-how uh, and their local network. Um, so we, we rely on the local partners to, for cross-border payment. So, so how the payment works is we settle our partners and they settle the local merchants. Um, I think you know, in terms of, uh, uh, if we talk about this from another angle, the user angle, not the merchant angle. I think you know it's it's a, a tougher question because uh, every again every country is so different and every country's users is so different. They they have different pain points. That's why you know w- you know we, we we when we look at the user market here, uh, you know we would the first question that we always need to answer is um, does you know every all the services we provide in China. Would it work in Italy? Would it work in UK? Which which services would be most interesting to users in France? So yeah, so so it's a it's a it's a uh, tough question to answer because it's so different, it's so diversified. We also went to speak with Chris Skinner to hear about some of the relationship and the views that he has between fintechs and big banks and how this affects cross border payments. Well, a lot of fintech startups begin with an idea that they can be a bank and get rid of these nasty banks that exist today. And then as they start getting into the complexities of the financial system and how it operates and the regulatory structures that go around that system, they begin to fail in their disruptive vision because if to be a bank, you have to be a bank. You've got to be regulated like a bank. Um, and obviously, some people think you can get away or around that challenge such as the Bitcoin libertarians Um, but they have also encountered so many issues about if you store and transfer money with no regulatory structure or governance then you have a problem I mean when um, the latest hack of Bitfinex came along um, people said this will never happen because you've got the multi-sig structures of Bitcoin that will stop this sort of hack well it's happened So you need a governance structure and that's where fintechs have ended up really becoming more partners of banks than challengers of banks. Now there are some things in fintech that are far more interesting that are augmenting the banking system um, by providing uh, services to different constituencies that could never be served by banks before. So in that case we're talking about emerging and developing economies, financial inclusion through mobile wallets. That's a fantastic revolution in sub-Saharan Africa that's taking place right now, Indonesia, Philippines. That's the area where fintech can really make a difference. And if we can get low-cost, real-time transfer between people directly uh, across borders globally through this new fintech structure, that's where I think we're going to see the revolution take place. Um, But it's not going to happen in the banking system. I also wanted to speak to Anders about some of his views on the banking giant's approach to entering the fintech space. I think it's, uh, I think they're behaving the right way. Uh, They have traditionally owned both the customer relationship 
and the core banking side. And now they are facing competition from uh, from a new group of incumbents, and it's quite naturally to actually try to make some investments within that field. First of all, to gain knowledge, and secondly, of course, to uh, to make sure that they they also have an ownership stake in some of the businesses that could potentially become successful over the next uh, five ten years. I think Do Deutsche Bank launched, launched the the fintech uh, program. I think it was July uh, this year. Uh, and have so far invested 750 million in uh, the digital space, uh, working with different incumbents in the fintech industry, uh, gaining them access to Deutsche's uh, products and services, and and then uh, fueling them for uh, and positioning them the right way. Well, our vision, I mean, our vision back to the vision of Ant Financial Services mm -hmm. Group is, we think financial services should be equally. Easy, easy access to everyone, to every common individual and small biz businesses. Um, so I think you know fin what fintech startup or fintech companies, the role we play is to make financial services inclusive to everyone, um, to make it easily ac accessible to everyone. So I think that's the role uh, we, 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 we're playing in the financial services industry. I wanted to find out more from Chris about the areas that banks should look at partnering with some of the fintech companies. Well, the main area where banks fall down is in um, onboarding customers because they have to go through this complex structure of know your client um, identity verification that's been around for decades and no one's really solved this for a bank. Um, and that's where I see interesting things happening around digital identity using distributed ledgers, for example, because you can start to see uh, startup companies saying, we can s solve some of the KYC issues um, by directly having identities registered in a sovereign state scheme, which um, is run through technology rather than through a bank, and that will allow a bank to therefore work with um, individuals and companies with a network of trust that doesn't exist today, which is the reason why you have to do all this onboarding KYC uh, malarkey that we have today. Um, and I've just been blogging about trade finance, for example, and some companies in the startup mode within trade finance and supply chain, where basically uh, what they're doing is creating a identity for companies in emerging markets that American and European banks have never dealt with before, and because they have a verified status on a blockchain, yeah. allows them to fund and provide trade finance to those companies because they can trust them when they couldn't before because they've got no idea who they are. And that's the sort of thing where I think you know, the fintech community is doing some interesting stuff. Equally, we talk a lot about um, Stripe, uh, Klarna, and others, and I think they're ex good examples, PayPal being the oldest, of taking friction out of the process of payments and making it just simpler and easier uh, and um, you know, allowing people to pay for things across borders without the challenge of working out how the hell do you get that done. You just send it via a, an email or via text now. I think uh, everyone is keeping an eye on how they're doing it because they're doing a very good job. Um, and I think uh, Alipay has the uh, advantage that they're connected to a platform that actually controls the products and controls the end, end customers. So I think they have an endless, they have endless uh, possibilities in which products they want to uh, offer on the Alibaba platforms and then that would be supported by Alipay which is then the the, the financial tech arm of, of, of the Alibaba group. I think it's, it's a model that, uh, that, that everybody would watch uh, with, with, with huge interest, definitely. We would enable them to access our platform and then distribute funds to any of the merchants that is using the platform. So let's assume there are merchants located in China or in the US that are selling goods and services via uh, the platform and using an organization like Alipay uh, to collect and distribute the funds. Alipay would then use our infrastructure to settle to the merchant's bank account in the countries where the merchants are based. Where do we sort of see the world from a, a, sort of a globalization standpoint? I think that's the trend we are, uh, we are, we are supporting right now because you've seen a movement over the last 10 years where consumers as you say they, they basically don't care where they're based in the Netherlands if they need a product that they can get on a Canadian platform they just want the product and someone uh, and uh, some some entities or some businesses 
have to support that growth, and that is what the fintech industry is doing. Uh, basically enabling the platforms to take payments from the consumers. And again, we are placed behind the fintech industry, enabling the fintech industry to then distribute the funds to, uh, to bank accounts all over the world. I was eager to find out what retailers currently accept Alipay and what's on the horizon for them. We started this, uh, our merchant development effort uh, only half a year ago. Uh, we have gained, I think, tremendous footprint uh, and we have several important launches this month, actually next month as well. Uh, but you know, what I can tell you is we have uh, several retailers uh, live with Alipay in Germany. Um, uh, and, uh, and we recently launched with Munich Airport. So 90% of the shops uh, on the air side on, in Munich Airport now all accept, accept Alipay. And also you know, our users enjoy exclusive offers uh, when they pay with Alipay. So Munich Airport is a you know, very, uh, how to say, uh, is a fantastic partner or a client. You know, they're working very closely with us to, um, to, you know, to, to provide uh, offers to our to our users, and you know our users love it. From 2004, when Alipay was created, until 2010, it was all like it was mostly PC-based transactions, you know, online payment for e-commerce. Um, and then when the e-commerce you know players in China were moving to mobile, our users, Alipay users, moved to mobile quite fast. Like in two years, you know, everyone was like shopping on mobile app instead of you know PC. And then in the past two years, uh, it was it it was amazing how uh, in the only two years, you know, the the how users uh, inter using mobile wallets to interact with physical world really took off in China. I think you know two years ago we couldn't imagine in China we couldn't imagine that in China now you go out you can go out without cash or a wallet. You just pay with your mobile wallet anywhere, taxis, shops, restaurants. Um, but now it's happening. Now it's, um, now, it, now it's like people's daily life. Um, so it took off quite fast. Um, I think you know, there are many, many reasons why this happened. But um, I think you know, in terms of Europe, um, because you know, the, the traditional financial uh, services infrastructure is probably more mature than China. Than China, China. Um, so uh, so probably, you know, so the users here are very used to using cards. Uh, so it's probably, take. It, I think it takes longer for people to change their habits uh, from using one thing to another thing. Um, but I do, yeah, so probably that's the difference. Um, but yeah, we, we believe that, you know, um, people would, you know, move to more convenient, more universal experience, uh, which is mobile. I think that it's a quite a good example on a tech giant moving into the fintech space. Uh, the trend that we'll most likely see is that the platforms like uh, that, that, that Alibaba owns will uh, eventually end up having a, a huge stake of the market because you can basically get everything. And uh, as Alipay is the uh, is the payment arm of the Alibaba Group, uh, it is is a natural movement that they will become a huge huge player within this space. I think already now they are they are catering for for around five percent of the of the global transactions. Uh, so so it's it's a very very interesting time within the space. Also to see how how powerful can these uh, businesses like like Alipay uh, end up being within the the financial space. Definitely. On the next episode of Fintech Finance, we take a deeper look at the customer experience, where we catch up with Lloyds, Barclays and Teleperformance to look at what role the contact centre plays in a stellar customer experience.